So I'm talking about the management of acute asthma and I'm going to introduce you to a couple of people and we're going to start with a bit of a tangent. And we might start with a, we'll press this a couple more times. Yeah, I'm pressing the big, big green one. So this is Phoebe. Uh, she's just turned 12. She's got infrequent episodic asthma and I'm talking about her briefly because she's friends of ours, um, goes to my kid's school. Um, she hates going to hospital, but she does have asthma. She's never been all that sick, but every time she comes to hospital, she asks if she's been intubated. And most of the time, someone has to explain to her what intubation is, and she's there with her asthma, and oh, sh you know, what's going to happen? Um, and have you ever been to ICU? So these are things we ask all the time. Um, I'm not sure how useful those things are. Because of um, our friendship, I've been asked to provide a little bit of a, a side advertisement for something that she's involved in. <laughs> and I actually intended to change my outfit to do the presentation. <laughs> However, um, I did have a call from my hospital's director of communications uh, <laughs> and told, you can't do this. So I'm still going to present a little bit. And so indulge me for a couple of minutes while we go through this. So briefly, it's a charity uh, based in Australia but reaches out to African kids um, who try and provide kids with an education, really because we know that an education is a very important social determinant of health and later well-being. So there's a few little highlights down the bottom that you can see, and we will see. Say she's an object, we'll play a little a bit of a burden. video and worthy of education, simply because she was born a girl. Without education, her future is dark. She's likely to be sold into marriage as a child, forced to have children before she's ready. And there are over 60 million girls around the world just like her. But we have the power to change it, and it's as simple as putting on a dress. This October, put on a school dress, pick a challenge, raise money, and you'll educate a girl. Join us and do it in a dress. Sign up today at doitinadress.com. And given that I had to change my outfit plans uh, leading up to the conference, I just thought as uh, another way of highlighting things a bit, if you're happy to Google, and Ian's actually tweeted out a link to Phoebe's page. She had her 12th birthday recently and decided that she didn't want any presents. She arranged donations for this charity instead. So that's pretty good. Um, if you Google that and donate, um, there's a copy of our book that whoever donates the most by the end of the session will get. <laughs> so there's a little silent auction going on. <laughs> if you just Google, do an address and Phoebe. So there you go. Uh, now we'll talk a bit about asthma. <laughs> so asthma basics, as you know, involve inhaled bronchodilators and steroids. I'm not going to talk anything more about that. The problem is when they're not working um, and you're faced with a child who's been given the standard treatment and is not getting better. There are a number of choices and you need to sort of think, well, what am I going to do next? From a researcher's point of view, the question is, well, what are you trying to achieve when you're doing this? So you've got this child with asthma. You're worried about them dying. You're worried about them being intubated. You're worried about whether they need to be transferred somewhere else whether they need intensive care, and so on and so forth. So when you're thinking about research, you've got to think about, well, what am I trying to look at from an outcome point of view? Do I want to improve his peak flow by 15%? Who measures peak flow in these kids? I don't. So knowing what you want to try and achieve with your treatment is an important question when you're talking about how to do the research. There are a number of options for these kids, and we're talking about intravenous therapy, intramuscular subcutaneous adrenaline, and various uh, means of respiratory support. So for the next 15 minutes, I wanted to talk a bit about what we know about variation in practice, what the best evidence is, and what we can learn from rheumatologists. 
about asthma. So first, variation in practice. There's been a couple of very large studies done by Peruki, which is the Paediatric Emergency Research in the United Kingdom and Ireland group. So uh, they're coming out of, surprisingly, the United Kingdom and Ireland. But what they did is they did a survey internationally, between the United Kingdom and Ireland, of clinician practice. And they surveyed 183 doctors working in emergency departments. 93% of them considered salbutamol the right thing to give, intravenous salbutamol, with these sick kids. But of the respondents, there were 10 different infusion rates and a tenfold variation in the rate that you deliver salbutamol. 77% said aminophilin be a reasonable thing to give. 5 milligram per kilo, up to 10 milligram per kilo. And again, there were nine different infusion rates on offer. Most people thought magnesium was pretty good, and most people had a similar dose, 40 to 50 milligram per kilo over 20 to 30 minutes. Some other interesting findings from their study. About a quarter said they'd use non-invasive ventilation. A small proportion would give Heliox, and one in 200 would give ketamine. So I think one person said they'd give ketamine. Interestingly, 62% said that intubation was out of their scope of practice. I haven't intubated in with asthma for a long time, but whether it's out of my scope of practice or not, I'm not sure. They also, so that's a survey, so they sent it out to people, they asked, what do you do? They also wanted to see what happens in real life. So in real life they asked, so which intravenous bron bronchodilators are being administered to children in the UK and Ireland? So they had 24 hospitals in their research network, they looked at over 3,000 asthma presentations over 10 weeks. It's a good way to get numbers up, you just have lots of friends get involved. 3% receive IV bronchodilators overall. The range in individual hospitals ranged from nobody got intravenous bronchodilators to up to almost one in five kids got intravenous bronchodilators. There's a fair bit of variation there. And it's unclear what the reason for variation is. in terms of what they gave, compared to the survey, which says 95% magnesium, 90-odd percent salbutamol, and 70-odd percent aminophilin, this is what was actually administered. So what you say you do and what you do is different. And in 110 patients, there were 30 different IV treatment regimens. So I think it's fair to say that we don't really know what we're doing. Well, what I do might be right, but what everyone else does is wrong, but <laughs> I don't even know what I do. So getting to the point of working out what is the best evidence that we have, I don't like to introduce you to somebody else. Some of you may already know this guy. Uh, he's got a quote. Surely a great criticism of our profession that we have not organised a critical summary by specialty or subspecialty adapted periodically, of all relevant randomised controlled trials. So, of course, this is Archie Cochrane. And the Cochrane Airways Group has just 50 different studies on acute asthma. Some of them say you should probably give steroids. Some of them say you can use puffers versus nebulizers. And we won't go through that sort of stuff. But I'll, I'll provide some of the information about the, the findings of the Cochrane studies that are relevant to the sicker kids with asthma. So these are the ones I just want to touch on. Magnesium, salbutamol, aminophilin, beta agonist versus aminophilin and ketamine. You look at the total studies that have made it into the Cochrane Review for these problems. So 15 studies, 580 patients for IV salbutamol. 11 trials for 157 children, so that means you've got oh, 16 kids in each trial. So not big trials, not big numbers. So magnesium, current evidence does not support the routine use of intravenous magnesium sulfate in all patients. I think that's fair. We don't give it to all patients. It appears to be safe and beneficial in patients who present with severe acute asthma. Additional studies are needed to confirm the subgroup findings from this review suggesting a beneficial effect of magnesium sulfate only in severe acute asthma. So we all give magnesium. 
Some of us give magnesium some of the time. Um, but that's what it's based on. And one of the things they noted is that in future studies, severity must be clearly defined and based on presenting pulmonary function results or other things, response to in initial beta agonist therapy whenever possible. We'll just pause and think about this for a minute. Does everyone in your department look at asthma the same way and say, you know, I think that kid's got severe asthma. Someone else comes and says, oh, moderate, well, they're not too bad. And how do we reproducibly assess asthma? Is my assessment the same as your assessment or your assessment or your assessment? So when you're trying to work out who's actually got severe asthma to, to start with, how can you apply this data? Does anyone use an asthma score, like a numeric score in their emergency department? Hands up, just a show of hands. Just So we've got three, four, five. So there's a few different people, a few different departments that use a clinical asthma score. As most people say, oh, they look all right. They look a bit sick. They might need a burst. Oh, they're pretty sick. <laughs> and you know, I think having some good, clear idea about what's severe and what's not severe is actually quite important. We'll move on. Salbutamol. Remember, we've got 15 trials, 700 odd patients. Until more adequately powered trials are conducted, it is not possible to form a robust evaluation of the addition of IV beta agonists in children. So we just don't know. Aminophilin, depending on which state of Australia, it's pretty fashionable in Victoria, it's not so fashionable in New South Wales. Improves lung function within six hours when you measure peak flow or some other pulmonary impedance or something like that. But it doesn't make you feel any better. It doesn't change nebulised treatments, it doesn't change hospital length of stay. We don't know whether it affects oxygenation, pick or admis admission or mechanical ventilation. But we do know that it makes you vomit. <laughs> but we have on Dancertron, so it's okay. <laughs> Ketamine, again. It's one study on non-intubated children with severe acute asthma did not show significant benefit. So as a bronchodilator, it's not very good. But it's fashionable. I'm not fashionable, but <laughs> ketamine's fashionable. Non-invasive ventilation, ca current evidence cannot confirm or reject the effects of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or treatment of children with acute asthma. So really, we just don't know. So arguably, more research is needed. And a lot of the Cochrane reviews come to the same conclusion. So Cochrane, they try and put everything together. And they want people to do sufficiently powered trials that are good, that measure things that are clinically important. So if you were to choose one outcome that you wanted to do a project on, what would it be? Are we worried about stopping kids being intubated? Are we worried about how long they're in hospital for? Are we worried about where they get transferred to or you know, what their peak flow is? what their pulmonary index score or the paediatric respiratory assessment measure score is at two hours after you've started giving intravenous bronchodilators. I don't know, but we've got to work out what's, what's a clinically important measure. And then you can start thinking about how you're going to design the trial. I'm one of the members of PREDICT and a couple of years ago, I thought, why don't we do a trial on asthma? That'd be a really good idea. And then I got asked a few questions. <laughs> and now I'm doing a PhD. And hopefully at the end of that, I might be able to answer some of this. I won't have the answer about which one to give, but maybe which ones to trial. We have done a systematic review of IV therapy for asthma that we're trying to get published at the moment. Um, and what we found is 38 studies in kids. There are 60 primary outcomes in 38 studies, which means that some studies had more than one primary outcome. And no two studies had the same outcomes. So it makes it a bit hard to work out what to do. So, you know, one was the pulmonary respiratory assessment measure at two hours after giving bronchodilators. Another one was a change in peak flow of more than 20%. Another one was hospital length of stay. Another one was this, another one was that. They're just all over the place. So there are lots of different outcomes. 
there's been a systematic review published a couple of years ago about clinical scores in asthma, and a few people put your hand up about clinical scores. There are 60 articles, they found 36 dyspnea scores applicable in children who wheeze. 22 of them were thought to be possibly useful, which means they thought another 14 were useless. <laughs> and none of the many dyspnea scores have been sufficiently validated to allow for clinically meaningful use. None of them. And they suggest that it's probably worth validating what we've got. So when you start comparing all the different asthma studies and all the different information we have about asthma, you're going from apples and oranges more to a fruit salad. And that's sort of what we're trying to tease out a bit at the moment. The reason I'm mentioning rheumatologists is that rheumatologists had all these discussions quite a while ago. The outcome measures in rheumatology group started with a bunch of clinicians getting together in a room and saying, it'd be good to sort of measure the same stuff. And then they decided what to measure. It's pretty good. And then how to measure it. I thought, oh, we better ask patients. And when they involve patients, they actually introduce some new measures that they hadn't thought of because they hadn't asked. Um, and then they developed a filter, which I'll talk about in a second, and then came up with recommendations for trials. It's quite clever, really, isn't it? The OMERAC filter, so when you're talking about which outcomes you're going to measure, they have these three overarching things. So truth, so is the outcome real? Does it tell you what it's meant to tell you? Is it valid? Is it reliable? Is it all that? Discrimination. So can you tell whether someone's better or not by looking at it? So you know, does the changes in the scale m mean something clinically? And is it feasible? So you have to do an autopsy to tell whether they got better. It's probably not feasible. <laughs> Whereas if you know, have to do a 75 question e point questionnaire, that's probably not feasible, but it needs to be feasible as well. And they've got some broad overarching domains for outcome measures that are essentially death or mortality, life impact, and under that you can put things like length of stay, time off work, those sorts of things. These are broadly applicable to all areas of medicine. Um, resource use, so intensive care admissions, economic analysis and all that, and then your pathophysiological manifestations. So if you're doing a trial on asthma, you'd be looking at work of breathing, oxygen saturations and so on. If you're doing a trial of STEMIs and you know, cardiac mortality, you'd be looking at you know, revascularization or troponin re levels or whatever. But these, these things are a nice way to think about clinical trials. So, so what does it mean for the patient? And what does it mean in these different contexts? What does it mean for the disease? What does it mean for the health system? So really where we've got to is what I'm going to be spending the next few years on, trying to work out measuring what matters in acute paediatric asthma. But you can look at this as a way of measuring what matters in all sorts of things, the, the framework we do it. Um, the COMET initiative, so the core outcome measures in effectiveness trials, is a group of people who got together and sort of, those rheumatologists are quite clever, we should do this for everything. And essentially, if you, if you look at them, there's a whole lot of methodology around getting people involved and working out what matters. And really, the, the key things is to get people to agree on what's important. And the people aren't necessarily just the clinicians. You've got to think about what patients want, what families want, what the government wants, how much things cost. But getting consensus, understanding the epidemiology and outcomes. So if we wanted to study a drug that reduced the r rate of intubation for asthma in kids. You'd need thousands and thousands of patients in each arm because we don't intubate very many. So you need to have an understanding of the epidemiology to really know what is important to measure but also what's feasible. And looking at the science of outcome measures, so understanding reliability, validity, all of those sort of slightly nerdy things to actually work out which ones are useful. Um, so fortunately, PREDICT is a member of a, a larger group of paediatric emergency research networks. So you can see up there, you've got the Canadians with PERC, uh, Peruki is the little owl that's sitting up there, uh, PECAN and PEMCRC are based in the USA, and REPEM is based in Europe, and we're based in Australia and New Zealand.
and we've gotten together a group of people and we're currently doing this. So we're developing a core outcome set and a consensus, a consensus statement on the conduct of RCTs for children with severe acute exacerbations of asthma. So I'd love to be able to tell you what to do. I don't know what to do. Um, but this is what we're doing to try and find out what to do. And it's not a quick and easy process because you've got to you know, work out what's important. But we want to really measure what matters to people. And only then can you start thinking about designing trials that are actually useful. And that's it. <laughs>